Hey up and welcome to another episode of Last Cast. Today you join us back up at Mo Moncton for a few hours and we're going to run you through a maggot feeder today. Basically it's one of the most simple methods that you'll see out there so it's, we're going to pretty much run it through today as sort of a beginner's guide to it. Keep things dead simple to start with and I'm going to show you a couple of sort of evolutions on the maggot feeder and basically go through a few hours of fishing it, see what I can pick up and sort of talk you through how the peg's developing as we go along. As I say, the maggot feed is about as self-explanatory as you're going to get. All you need bait-wise is maggots, really. I've got some casters and pellets on there, just in case we get bitted out with small fish. Again, that's going back to what I was saying about having a bit of an evolution on it, being able to sort of progress the peg, um, being that maggots aren't particularly selective. You can introduce a couple of different baits um, from that point of view and try and get a few better fish. But as I say, we're going to be looking at maggots predominantly today. What I'm going to do now is quickly run you through the rig that you use for maggot feeder fishing. Now, I'll run you through initially the simplest version, which I tend to use sort of on most venues where you're just going to chuck a feeder out. And then I'll show you the sort of the evolution on it that I'm going to use today. A slightly different rig, incorporating a few different elements. So hopefully that'll change how, how we go about catching the fish. In terms of the tackle that I'm using today, things are dead simple. I've got a 10 foot um, Shakespeare Sigma wand, a light rod that you'll see, see me use for a lot of my river fishing and also on still waters. Nice and short, 10 foot length, but still long enough to get a decent cast out. As you can see, we've got an island at a fair distance to this. It's probably 25, 30 metres that we're going to be chucking. Um, so a nice soft rod with the second grey quiver tip in it. Really soft, but I've not gone for the lightest because I want the fish to hook themselves to a degree. I want them to be able to prick themselves against that tip. Again, I'll come back to that when I look at the rigs in a second. The reel is a 3012 size Daewoo TDM, and that's loaded up with five pound Daewoo TDR. Dead simple, nice robust mainline, but equally with it being high tech, good bite registration, nice and thin for casting. So that's dead simple. So you don't need to go spending a fortune on rods and reels for this kind of fishing. Something about 10 foot for your commercial work, maybe nine foot on smaller lakes, and a 3,000 size reel will do you nicely. In terms of the rig that I'm going to use today, I'll show you initially, not the one I'll actually fish with today, is the simplest maggot feeder rig that I, I'd personally go and use. You can see a lot of people using, say, quick change beads, um, the Drennan ones and Coran ones are very good. I don't tend to like that because the, the line can wrap around the swivel on the feeder. What I like to use is a twizzle boom that you'll see a lot of um, sort of slightly higher end anglers use on bigger venues. And it's a, a rig that you'll see me talk about when I'm talking about any of my feeder fishing on rivers or still waters. So this is how to tie it, it's dead simple. All you need is a little swivel stop clip bead. Just thread the line through the eye, pop my glasses on, eyesight's given up on me a little bit so I'll pop them on and it's dead simple you just thread that onto your main line just pull that out of my mouth that's obviously where you're going to change it clip your um, your feeder onto on natural venues I'd usually put a small float stop behind that just to create a bolt effect say we we're fishing for a lot of roach um, and that then we were sort of missing bites then you can always bring that stop down and create a bolt effect whereas on commercial fishers like this you really need to be using free running rigs the next stage is then making the twizzle boom it's dead simple and you can always incorporate a swivel into this rig at this point but when you've got a short chuck it's easy just to go loop to loop all I'm doing there is just twisting the line slightly and you'll see that forms a small loop there. Basically at this point you can pull it down to the smallest size you want so you can thread your hook through and that's obviously where your hook length's going to go. Then it's a case of just counter rotating the two bits of line, keep twizzling them and you'll see you start to form that boom there. Again, the thinner the line, the harder this is to do. If you've got sort of six, seven, eight pound main lines, much easier to do. So again, if you're just starting out with feeder fishing, go for a slightly heavier main line because it doesn't really do any harm. So you can see there, I've tied, I've made the twizzle boom. Need to make it long enough that when you put your, your stops on, which in this case I'll be using stops there, that it sits below the length of the feeder. So the feeder's going to be about two inches in length. So that means that this is actually going to clear the feeder and it'll kick the, uh, the, the hook length away from the feeder on the cast, prevents tangles. Then all, all I do to lock that off is tie a figure of eight knot, create a little loop, go around it twice, round the back, and then just pull. The, um, the link there through, holding the knot so you keep it towards the top end of where you've made your twizzle boom. That way you're not wasting too much line that you've twizzled. Pull it down, and then just trim the tag end off, dead simple. Then all I tend to use, say if you're wanting to be fishing somewhere where there's a lot more snags and things like that, sometimes you can incorporate float stops to, to create a stop there. But for me, keep it dead simple, just use a couple of stops. Usually number eights, but again, when you're going much finer main line, something like a number nine, and you can put usually just one or two. If I'm casting a long way, then I like to use two. If I'm casting short distance, then one, one suffices because I'm using a lighter feeder. 
and there you go that's your basic feeder rig as you can see there nice stiff boom from the twizzled line you've got your link a stop and when you put a feeder on there just pull one out here dead quick you'll be able to see that it'll sit nice and clear from that clip link so as you can see that's what you're looking for is this length of the twizzle boom will sit below the feeder so there's no way that, that can wrap and get caught around the feeder because it's too stiff and it'll keep your hook length away the rig that i'm actually going to use today is a bit of a variation on this with a couple of different things incorporated so i'll pop this to one side give myself a little bit more line and show you what i'm using today the temperatures are up a little bit so i'm looking to create a sort of fall of the the maggots through the water with that kind of rig the feed is effectively going to go straight to the bottom you're not going to get too many maggots coming out on the way down so you're effectively looking there more for a rig that you, you'll use in winter where you don't need to draw fish into the peg the fish will be somewhere near the bottom and you're just creating a nice little tight area feed on a day like this where the temperatures are up just a little bit i want some bait falling through the water so i'm actually going to use a variation on this rig with a few different elements incorporated into it so the first thing is i'm going to use a long link rather than that standard clip link you can see there this one's a long one from Preston innovation it's probably about three or four inches long and this is going to create a pattern oster which is again a bit more of an advanced feeder rig but it allows me to fish the bait a bit more through the water column without using a really long hook length so that's going to go on as a change there exactly the same thing again create my twizzle boom but this time it's not going to be as long because i'm going to use an extra link of line in the in between this and the hook length so i'll probably only do the twizzle boom this time about three or four inches long and again if you pull it down tight there like that you can see that it makes that loop that bit smaller and again when you're trying to keep the rigs nice and neat and compact it's a useful little thing to do that so making a twizzle boom there not too long probably about two or three inches this time exactly the same way of sealing that that twizzle boom off as you can see like so a little figure of eight loop pull that down nice and tight as always with your knots wet them and when you pull it tight give it a couple of seconds to bed down especially especially because using a doubled up length of line it needs that little bit longer to bed in Otherwise, when you do hook a decent fish, that knot will tighten down and effectively strangle itself and break, which is the last thing you want on a commercial fishery. So you can see there, the little twizzle boom, exactly the same thing again. Just going to put a little number eight stot on there, and that's going to create the stop. Use stots for this rather than shot, because obviously shot damages the line a lot more than stots. Stots are a much so softer lead. So just going to bite that on the line nice and gently just trim that down a little bit again you don't want the tag end too long because it can cause tangles but equally don't cut it too short just in case the knot does does budge if you hook a big carp so you can see that i've got a twizzle boom and it's up to that that this link will stop as you can see there just kicks out from there and what i'm going to put in there now is a fluorocarbon link about 18 inches long and this is effectively going to be an extension of that twizzle boom but the reason why i'm using fluorocarbon in this case if i can get it open is the fact that it's actually stiffer than the main line although it's the same diameter of 018 it's much stiffer and equally it's clear you can see there the way it comes off the spool it actually is fairly kinked the way it does it so what you want to do is give yourself a decent length of line and then what i'm going to do is tie a loop in each end Again, all you use is one of the, um, the census loop tyres. These help you keep your loops nice and small, small and nice and regular, really useful bits of kit. So well worth, well worth acquiring if you struggle with, um, with tying loops to a decent sort of small size. Just gonna tie a loop in one end. Again, wet the knot. And as always, especially with fluorocarbon as well, you need to give it a chance to bed down because it doesn't have the same level of stretch that you get in mono. So exactly the same, just trim that off. As I say, I'm giving myself probably 18 inches. And what this is going to create is sort of a junction between where my feeder link is there and the hook length. Because the hook length I want to use is quite fine for presenting a maggot hook bait. So I can get away with small hook lengths, but the problem is with those, that they're more likely to tangle and spin up when you're retrieving. So that's the job of this link to take out some of that spin and kick the, um, the, the little hook length away after the cast 
So although this might look complicated, hopefully as we go through the session, I'll be able to explain why I'm using it. So I just have to thread this on here. It might be a bit fiddly because I've tied that loop really small. Again, worth taking your time over your rigs when you are starting a session like this. So I'm just attaching that in the same way that you'd attach a loop-to-loop -loop hook length. And what this, this little link here as well will also allow me to do is change hook lengths really easily without having to sort of carry long hook lengths. What I'm going to be using today is actually a six inch um, pole fishing hook length, as I was saying, about being able to keep keep versatile with my hook, hook patterns and keep changing them. It's a bit fiddly to get this threaded through here. But it means I can use different hook lengths, change them nice and easily, and as I say, I'm not having to tackle down sort of a two foot hook length or cut anything down. If I need to change anything, I could just change this link should I need to shorten it. So I'll just try and thread this through here because I've made the loop very small. Leave that to sort in a second. But basically all I'm going to attach onto the end of there now, you can see this is almost the finished rig. All I've got to do now is attach a feeder and a hook length. So my feeder's going to sit on there. As you can see, this boom that I've created, I'll finish those loops off in a second, kicks that away from the, the feeder. And then we've got a nice long 18 inch section of 018 fluorocarbon there. Onto the end of that, I'm going to put on, as I said, a standard six inch pole hook length that I've got tied up here. So I've got plenty to go at. I've got a choice between sort of silverfish hook lengths and carp hook lengths. But because I'm using a fairly thick, um, almost leader type there, I can step up from saying, I might start on an 010 fluorocarbon hook length to a little 18 silverfish maggot hook. And I might move on to sort of carp hook lengths with 013, a bit stronger gear. Again, just depends what we're catching, but it's dead simple. And the principle behind this is twofold. What I'm looking to do is actually catch fish as this, the, uh, the feed is just settling. I'm using a feeder that I've modified, which I'll run through when we actually start fishing of using bigger holes. So what I'm looking to do, as I said, it's sort of an evolution on the maggot feeder itself, is try and create a column of bait falling through the water. Now that the temperatures are warmed up, those fish are going to come up in the water column. I need to sort of draw them down to where I can catch them on the feeder. By using a nice long link um, and a, this long 18 inch section of fluorocarbon there, then the maggot's going to follow the feeder down much, for, be much further behind the feeder when it's falling. So as that feeder goes through, the fish have longer to see this hook length. And hopefully by using a stiff link of the fluorocarbon there, get good bad bite registration. So I'll quickly finish this rig off, show you the feeders, and then we'll start fishing. And as I say, try and put it into practice and show you what we're actually doing and trying to achieve by making these changes to the rig right so there you go there's my finished rig i've put my feeder on and i've attached a hook length as i said by having that link there i can use six inch pole hook length so i don't have to tie any specific hook lengths up and it's dead quick to change um, and also as i said earlier because i'm using a stiffer section of fluorocarbon there it means that it's kicking the line away where otherwise i'd be using effectively the same hook length material so a bit more durability as well but so that's that looked at and we'll change the hook length as we go through the day if we start encountering better fish but we'll have a quick look at the feeders that i'm going to use today now i carry a few different patterns just take a couple out here for an example I always carry a few cams and black caps for the um, for the rivers which don't really like to use for this style of fishing on, on still waters because what i'm looking to do as i said earlier is create a trailer bait through the water so what i like to use are these drenning ones which are bottom loaded so the way they fall is directly down forcing water through and hopefully getting maggots to crawl out the top now those are all right when you're looking to keep the fish down in the water a bit more um, when the holes are that kind of size you're going to get most of the bait released near the bottom as you can see the geese are going a bit mad today so it's going to be interesting with them um, as i was saying with the holes of standard size you're going to get a steady release of maggots again in winter that's what you're looking to do create a trickle of bait whereas this time year, i'm looking to do, introduce more baits so the feeders that i'm actually using today similar kind of pattern but a bit nicer for casting of the drenum feeder bomb same thing bottom loaded but slightly bigger holes in the base so more water is going to get forced through them and as you can see it's got a few holes up towards the top now that's a standard one i'm using them in 16 grams this nice and light 
that's the one that I've got. Now you can see there what I've done is actually bored out the holes using a, a crosshead screwdriver, but I've only bored out the ones in the top of the feeder. What I'm looking to do, as I said earlier, is create a column of bait. And this is what I mean about sort of an evolution on feeder fishing is getting the feeder to, to create a circumstance in your peg, which you're looking for. If you're trying to get fish feeding up in the water, then you can still achieve that with a feeder by making some adjustments. So choosing a lighter feeder, one that's bottom loaded, and then by boring out the holes on the top, as I said, the water should rush through the bottom and force more maggots out of the top end there creates a nice small column of bait which as the rig falls my hook bait will be following behind nice and tight and hopefully what we'll end up doing is hooking quite a few fish in the bottom lip hopefully what will happen is they're following the feeder down and before that bait's settled hopefully what will happen is they'll grab the bait and swim back up within the water column and that will tell us whether the fish are actually following the feed up in the water or whether they're going to be down on the deck again temperatures aren't particularly high today so if it does turn into a day where i'm looking to catch on the deck i'll shorten this fluorocarbon link down and move back to a more standard size or more uh, standard feeder um, without the modifications on it but again because the temperature are up slightly i want to draw fish into the peg initially so by getting um, a trail of maggots falling through the water like this by modifying your feeders you can achieve that and hopefully today we'll catch a few silverfish doing that so that's everything looked at as i say it might seem a bit complicated but it's just something to think about a bit more when you feed fishing making a few adjustments to your rig and hopefully we'll be able to put this into practice now and show you how to catch a few fish right so i'm now going to go for the first chuck of the session key thing with maggot feeder fishing is getting your hook bait on before you actually fill the feeder now what i like to do i'll start on a single maggot but what i like to do with these is make sure that when i'm using a hook it's got a beaked point just to make sure that the maggot has a bit of a harder job falling off sometimes if you're getting a lot of fish in the peg then it's better to use a dead maggot rather than a live because it'll obviously stay on the hook a, li a little bit longer then obviously it's pretty self-explanatory how to fill the feeders but the key thing is that you're ready to cast as soon as you've filled it now one thing that i'll do again because i'm trying to catch fish through the water a bit more is i won't fill the feeder right to the brim i want the maggots to have some space to start moving but again by having those smaller holes at the bottom and the bigger ones at the top the maggots can't get out quite as easily before i've made my first cast so exactly the same as usual far bank marker and using a line clip hit the clip watch the feeder go in try and sink the line nice and quick again rather than with the ground bait feeder you can get away with moving the feeder just a little bit more and obviously when you've got carp in a venue you want to sink the line nice and quick now a key thing is obviously when i'm trying to catch fish through the water like this is i'm getting that feeder to swing towards me by using a line clip and tightening up as it's actually falling so that means that the the hook bit's actually tight to the feeder quite nicely but it's falling slightly further behind the feeder so it's not going to tangle so that's one thing to think about and also what you want to be doing is tighten up nice and quick because as i said today we're looking for bites fairly quickly and when the the feed is actually falling so what i don't want to be doing is spending ages sinking the line again using a, a nice high tech and thin main line means that you can get the line beneath the surface quick and you also get better bite registration again natural venues i'd probably use braid for this kind of fishing to try and accentuate that bolt effect but what we'll do now is keep getting a few casts going into the peg and hopefully when we start getting a few bites we'll explain what's happening in the peg and basically how things are progressing it's a little bit of a line bite there again one useful thing is to twitch that feeder back and again that's just straight that'll straighten out the hook length behind the feeder again getting better bite registration because obviously using that fluorocarbon because it's a stiff link what it'll do is kick that that hook bait out further away from the feeder um, once it's actually settled in the peg again obviously if you're using mono hook lengths or standard mono hook lengths what will happen is that hook bait will land surprisingly close to the feeder if you ever watch any underwater footage if you're fishing a two three foot hook length quite often it'll land only sort of 12 18 inches from your feeder so again using a nice stiff link like that means that i can get away with using a nice quality thin um, hook link but equally i'm not having to use as i say two feet of it and risking that hook bait landing too close and then obviously compensating bite registration so it's little differences like that, that i've made to the rig that hopefully when we start getting into a few fish will make a big difference so i say we'll time the cast today probably about three minutes to start off with each chuck get some bait going through the peg try and draw a few fish in so i say we're not fishing too tight to the island because we're looking for a mixed bag so we'll crack on get a few casts in and hopefully it won't be long before we're into the first fish there we go there's a bite right so we're into our first fish of the session already on the third cast 
Not sure whether it's a small fish or whether it's nice, no, really small fish that, but good response straight away. Third chuck, nice little pluck on the rod tip after about 30 seconds of that feeder being settled. It's only a small roach, but because we're fishing to an island, hopefully, not fi we're probably fishing nearer the bottom of the shelf, hopefully we'll catch a few better stamp fish than that, but we're off to the a good start already after the third chuck, so nice little indication on the on the feeder. And again, because I'm only feeding, fi filling the, uh, the feeder half full, if I do get a bite quite quickly, I'm not worried about spreading loads of bait all over my peg. So as you can see, all I'm doing, once I fill the feeder, is just filling it effectively halfway. And that gives the maggots plenty of space to start moving and get out the feeder nice and quick. So that's a good little start, that. Again, as soon as that feeder hits the surface, getting that rod tip well under the water, a couple of turns of the reel, chop the rod up like you would when you're waggler fishing, and then just pulling that feeder back, as I said earlier, to straighten that hook length out. As I say, that fish had the feeder after probably 30 seconds of it being in. Nice little indication where it's just picked up the maggot hook bait. One thing to also consider, I'm using a light hook length to start with a little size 18 silverfish maggot hook. Um, with no 10 fluorocarbon hook length, just trying to get bites. But what I'm doing by casting out and then quickly sinking the line and getting a couple of turns on the reel is if I do hook a carp, that gives me a bit of extra time to un unclip if the carp does decide to run around the island a little bit. And obviously, if I start hooking carp regularly, I can always step up hook lengths. As I say, because I've got, I'm using six inch hook lengths, I can use any from my pole rigs. Um, just makes life easy and I can step up to say, sort of size 50, well, size um, 16 camps and animals, double maggots should I need to. And again, by starting with a nice strong main line and that quite strong 018 leader as well, I can step up to whatever size hook length I need to. So again, that feed has been in there for about 30, 40 seconds, just giving it a twitch back and letting it settle again. As I say, hopefully it won't be long before we're getting a few more regular bites, getting into a few better fish as well. Again, it probably won't be long if we start getting a few roach like that kind of size that I'm starting to put a few micros through the feeder. These I've just got dry. Again, if you soak them, there's a risk of them sort of dampening the maggots in your, your bait box and things like that and getting stuck in the feeder. So keeping them dry means that they're going to fall slower, get out the feeder a bit easier as well. And obviously I've got a few casters there again. Using decent sized holes on the, uh, the feeder where I've bored them out, I can get away with putting casters in the feeder as well. Just giving myself a couple of options. So as I say, we'll keep an eye on the quiver tip, keeping it to three minute cast so far. As I say, we've had a fish on the third one, so hopefully after about 20, 30 minutes, we'll get a few more bites, get a bit more bait in the peg and see if we can catch a few better fish. Right, there's another fish on now. Quite a gentle bite, that one. Feels slightly bigger, this, probably another roach. But again, these bites are coming right after casting. <laughs> so quickly pop the hook out this one. As you can see there, that's what I was going to explain there. Th that fish is hooked squarely in the bottom lip. If I can hold that to camera there a little bit, you might be able to see. And that's what we're looking for. The bite's nice and quick once that feed has gone in and hooking those fish in the bottom lip. So what that tells me is those fish are actually following the feeder down, picking up the hook bait and then swimming up in the water. And that's why they're getting hooked in the bottom lip. Again, using nice fine wire sharp hooks means that the hook gets in nice and quick as well. So that's a good sign already on what's probably the only only the fifth cast of the day. So I'm going to pop a, another half feeder full of maggots in and get this chucked out again. Again, exactly the same principle, sinking the line nice and quick, chopping under the water, then just dragging that feeder back to straighten everything out. One thing that I will point out as well, or two things really, to do with the rod position and the rod rest. What I'm leaving is plenty of clearance for me to strike back. I'm not having the rod at sort of a 90 degree angle. It's more sort of 45 to the, um, the feeder. And that means I've got plenty of room to strike back to pick up that longer hook length. Again, when you're fishing short hook lengths, you don't really need that so much, um, but it does help. 
and the other thing is I've got the rod on my knee and I'm using quite a, a wide um, rod rest rather than sort of the traditional sort of one one groove rod rest. It means that I can locate the rod rest nice and quick, get the rod down nice and quick. And because it's on my knee as well, I'm not fiddling around trying to fit the rod into a butt rest. And obviously because we're looking for quick bites when the feed has gone in, I want to be on that fish as quick as I can be. So again, just going to twitch that feeder back. You can see it's dead easy just to drop the rod on the rest and it's across my knee so the rod's already set nice and quickly. To start with as well, one thing I'll point out is I'm also fishing a fairly slack line to it. Until the f fish start really attacking the feeder aggressively, I won't start tightening that quiver tip up. So at this stage in the, the sort of session after sort of five or six casts, what I'm looking to do is just establish what's in the peg. By using a nice soft, soft quiver tip, what I'm able to do is see a lot of line bites. We had a few indications before that second roach there. And again, using a soft quiver tip and having a nice slack line to it, or semi-slack line to it, I should say, means that I can see when the fish are in my pegs. So obviously, if we're getting line bites from bream or carp, you know, it's things like that that you're looking for at this stage. When you get a lot of fish in your peg, that's when you want to start tightening the line up, fishing a, a tighter um, line to the quiver tip and getting the fish to start pricking themselves when they do pick up that hook bait. Again, exactly what I was saying with the the, feed, the um, fluorocarbon link means that the fish will feel the rod tip nice and quick and start to hook themselves. So obviously hopefully as the day starts to warm up a bit more, get a few more fish in the peg and feed him more aggressively, we'll start to see if we can put that into practice and get that happening. Right, so we're only about 20 minutes into the session now and we're starting to get line bites quite regularly. I've noticed it's after about a minute and a half of the feeder going in. Again, this is why it's important to start timing your casts because then you can tell how quick the fish are coming to the feeder. And then obviously when you start getting bites, taking note of your bite time as well, tells you how quickly the fish are going through the feed. Again, obviously what we're doing today is sort of like a little introduction into maggot feeder fishing, but hopefully there's a few things that we can take away from it today that will translate into other elements of feeder fishing. Obviously when we go start going to the reservoirs and mill ponds in the next few weeks and months, we're going to be doing a bit of feeder fishing there and hopefully this will, pro well, as I say, we'll put the same kind of principles into practice there about timing casts. Um, regularity of feeding and also making little modifications to the rig to try and make it behave how you want it to. One interesting thing, there's a nice positive line bite there. Might be a fish on actually. I think there is as well, small fish. One thing to take note of, as I was going to say there, apart from your casting time is your bite time as well. Slightly better stamp fish this. Another little roach. And again, you can see that one's hooked in the bottom lip again. This is what we're looking for. Is um, one thing that I was going to point out, sorry, was the fact that we are actually fishing in quite coloured water today. And obviously a maggot feeder, especially traditionally on rivers, you'd use a maggot feeder in clear water conditions. And that's where it really does sort of shine. Um, obviously ground bait has more smell and attractant in coloured water. So one thing that's worth considering is when you are fishing on a coloured venue like this, the fish aren't just going to happen to stumble across maggots on the bottom. In winter, it's nice and effective, I was saying earlier, because the maggots are quite visual when the, the um, water's a bit, a bit uh, less coloured. When there's a bit more colour to it, you need to have some movement there. And obviously by having that, that um, bit falling through the water, it draws fish into the peg that much quicker. So little things, little things to think about like that. Obviously in summer, a little and often principle works, or whenever the weather warms up, loose feeding starts to work better. So you can obviously look at your feeder fish and actually start to imitate that by modifying your feeders a little bit. And as I say, it's working quite well for us so far. Let's quickly sort this little mess out that I've made while I've been talking to camera. And have another recast. And obviously as well, by having bit of bait falling through the peg nicely like this not the best cast of the day that one you're drawing fish into the peg all the time but equally it means that the fish are actually looking for the bait so you can get away with casting around the peg just that little bit more than you would do say if you're feeding fishing a method feeder or ground bait feeder you need to be dropping it down the same hole every time whereas by loose feeding similar kind of, of um, principle to when you float fishing or shallow fishing is trying to build a peg over an area, get a few fish moving in and out, grubbing around, and obviously by having maggots falling through the water at currently three minute intervals like we're doing with the feeder so far, it's getting fish sort of grubbing around, competing at all levels in the water. 
and what that in turn means is that the fish don't have that long to, to sort of look at your hook bait they have to go down take it quickly and they'll move off quite quickly to look for other food particles rather than it being in one little pile of maggots what you've got is a decent spread of them around the peg so obviously when the fish are picking them up to find another one they've got to move further again increasing the um, sort of the, the bite registration you're getting fish hooking themselves and more aggressive bites that as I say we've been getting already So as I say, we'll plug away with this. I think that's most of the tips that we've that I'm trying to get across covered so far. Um, and we'll crack on with the fishing, as I say, hopefully try and get a few better fish on the bank for you. Right, we've just hooked a better fish now on the uh, the maggot feeder. This feels like a skimmer there, nice steady bite. And what I've done is switched over to a double dead maggot. And I've also started running a few more micros through the feeder, probably half and half. It's taken about 40 odd minutes or so. We had a little skimmer earlier and a better roach, and this is the first sort of decent-ish skimmer that we've had. Again, not a big fish, but what I noticed was I was getting a lot less little indications and plucks off small roach, generally a lot less bites, but I was getting quite a few indications there were some better fish in the peg, so clearly that's what's been down there, a few skimmers. So we'll plug away at this for another hour or so and just see what we can catch in terms of getting a few better fish on, on the bank if possible. But as I say, today's video is really just an introduction into maggot feeder fishing. Obviously, it's just really here to get bites. That's the main thing with the, the method. Not being too selective, so obviously you do run the risk like we have been so far of being roached out, but by making a little change like changing the hook bait to dead red maggots and then putting a few micros through the feeder, which can quite often work on these commercial fisheries. We've just had a couple of skimmers. And equally, what I'm also doing is letting the bite develop fully now. So I'm still using the same feeder. Um, I've gone back to a slightly longer hook length. And one thing you'll also notice there in the rig, I've introduced a little swivel because we were getting a lot of bites off roach and I was in and out probably every minute. So again, you can just incorporate little things like that into the rig just to sort of remove the line twist. Especially when you're in and out near, near enough constant like we have been earlier. But this little change to putting some micros through the feeder few less maggots and using double dead red on the hook as you can see you've completely changed the session really with what we're catching cut down on the roach bites as i say we'll plug away with this see if we can get a couple of better skimmers on the bank for you before we decide to wrap up this little video Again, in line with what I'm doing, I could equally go back to using sort of a traditional maggot feeder as well without the larger holes, but I, I do still want to keep some bait going through the peg and falling through the water column a little bit just to try and draw a few fish in. As I say, we're getting bites pretty much every cast now, and as I've said also, getting plenty of line bites as well, so it is telling me there's the odd bream down there to be caught. So it'll be interesting, as I say, in this last sort of hour that we've got on this little method, be interesting to see if we can catch a couple of them for you. But we'll definitely look at this method. It's a bit of an indication there. We'll definitely look at this method in more detail and also probably use it more effectively when we do go onto our natural reservoirs and our natural venues like the reservoirs and mill ponds that are local to us as well. So as soon as the weather warms up a little bit, we'll be down there and hopefully it'll prove a bit more effective and we'll try and get a few better bags of fish out, especially the roach and things like that in, and perch. Especially at the reservoir can be really susceptible to this kind of method, so it'd be one to, to keep an eye out for in future. Right, we've just hooked a decent fish now on the, on the tip there. Let that bite develop for quite a while and this feels like a good bream. Again, little things about putting more pellets through the, the feeder certainly bring these into the pegs it's sort of as i say a few hours into the the session the short little session on the feeder and ever since i've been putting a few more micros into the into the mix i've had a few more line bites few fewer roach i'll say this is the first proper bream that we've hooked it's just sort of plodding around at the moment but you can see using nice soft rods like this good fun and when you've had plenty of roach to keep the the sport going as well makes for a good little session that's a nice bream that again one of those classic bream bites nice pull round on the tip you can see really old fish that one just get the hook popped out of him 
And as you can see, in you know, contrast to the little roach we've been catching, that's a good few pound, that one. Hooked well down because I was letting the bite develop, as you can see. Proper skim of that one. Get him popped back. So I say that little change with the micro pellets, that's what I think's made the difference there. And obviously when you do start getting, the, well, when the root spikes do start drying up, you start getting a few more line bites, then it's worth just sitting it out with a couple of dead maggots on the hook just to see if there's a, there's a better fish down there, like there was in that case. So we'll get this feeder back out there and see if we can have another couple of fish. Right, so we've just hooked into another fish now on the maggot feeder. Doesn't feel like a particularly big fish, but I think we'll probably call this the last one of this short little session we've had. Say, so not been here too long, been catching plenty of these little roach, getting pretty much a bite to chuck, which can't really complain on a hard day. So, so we've not really seen the full potential of this maggot feeder tactic today, so hopefully what we'll do is return and use it on a more natural venue, probably hilltop reservoir, when the conditions are a little bit better, a little bit warmer, and so say that's when it should really come into its own. Hopefully there we can put together a nice bag of roach, but the key thing is today, the, the temperatures haven't been up, and by ringing a few changes, we've caught a few nice fish, kept bites coming, had a couple of skims as well by bringing in micro pellets into the mix, little things like that. And as I say, just giving you a bit of an introduction into maggot fishing, maggot feeder fishing, and little changes you can make as you go along to try and get a few different feeding fish in the peg. As I say, keep your eyes peeled for that next video that we'll be bringing out in the next few weeks, hopefully, um, about maggot feeder fishing on the, the reservoir. But as I say, we've had a cracking little session today at, at Mo Moncton Pools. Good little introduction into maggot feeder fishing. So as always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you on that next episode.